Welcome everyone to this event on how finance and business can progress the living wage and decent work as part of Living Wage Week 2021, which is the annual celebration of the living wage movement. We're geared up today for a really dynamic discussion and um, invite you to please post your questions and comments throughout the event via the chat um, in the channel where um, we'll get to these at the Q&A at the end of the session. And you can also continue the conversation with us afterwards on LinkedIn. I'm Lucy Auden. I manage the Investment Leaders Group convened by the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And we're a group of leading investment organisations working together to co-create actionable research that addresses the greatest challenges in progressing sustainable investment. Together with our members and my colleague Jason Teo, we're currently working to understand and demonstrate how investors can progress progress uh, decent work, which includes the payment of a living wage through investment decision making and engagement. This builds on previous research from the group on measuring the impact that portfolios have on people and the planet. I'm delight delighted to be joined today by my colleague, Dr. Anna Barford, a CISL Prince of Wales Fellow. She's working with Unilever and our colleague, Marina Zarilla, to research pathways to decent work that support the business case for the living wage within circular and linear models. Anna's previous research with Safi Ahmed argued that circular economy principles for rejuvenating and restoring material materials should also be applied to labor relations. And as we build a new form of economy, their research proposes that the rights and needs of workers should be at the foreground. Anna's team are now researching how companies are moving towards living wage commitments and payments. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our fantastic panelists today. So we're joined by Julie Valla, Vice President of Human Rights at L'Oreal, Rachel Coburn Walden, Global Director of Human Rights at Unilever, Laura Bosk, Social Engagement Specialist at Rubico, and Martin Buttle, Head of Good Work at Share Action. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Anna to kick off today's discussion. Anna, over to you. Excellent, thank you Lucy, um, and welcome to all our panellists. Today we're here to talk about how finance and business can progress decent work and the living wage. Um, and to start with, I want to invite all our panellists to introduce themselves um, so we've got more of an understanding of who they are and where, where they're coming from. As you might expect, we've got people from the finance side and from the business side. So we'll, we'll start with finance and I'll ask Laura, would you introduce yourself first, please? Sure. So good afternoon and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here and thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. So my name is Laura Bosk and I work as a social engagement specialist at Rubico. Rubico is an asset manager with a long term uh, investment view where we basically manage about 200 billion euros uh, AUM on behalf of our clients, which are mainly institutional ones like pension funds and insurers. And for us, sustainability is really at the core of the work that we do. So all of our investment strategies actually integrate sustainability in different shapes and forms. But we also take ownership of our investment decisions. And once we invest in a company, we also engage with them to not them to improve their sustainability performance and among some of the topics that we discuss with them it's also a topic of decent work and living wages. Laura thank you also um, from the finance side I'd like to send to Martin please to introduce yourself. Good, good afternoon it's a real pleasure to be here and thank you thank you for the invitation to speak. So I, I'm Martin Buttle I'm, I'm head of good work at Share Action. Share Action is a, a charity um, that works with the finance system um, and financial investors to um, ensure that it's responsible for its impacts on people and planet. And we do that in three main ways. So the first way is we benchmark um, investors on their policies and approaches to responsible investment. And then we work with them to engage with them and use their influence to influence um, corporate practice. We work with policymakers and regulators to um, drive the uptake of responsible investment uh, policy, both in the UK, but also globally. And we work with individuals to educate and empower them to, to understand you know, how their money works and what the influence of that money can be on, on the global economy and on society. Excellent, thank you, Martin. Um, and now to Julie, um, your turn for an introduction, please. 
Sure, thank you for your invitation. Uh, so I'm Julie Valla in charge of uh, human rights for, for L'Oréal. It's uh, based in the in the corporate, you know, sustainability department, and uh, we have a team of human rights uh, correspondents in all our markets, all over the the world. So interacting with many colleagues from HR, from procurement, internal experts, but also external experts, as these issues are very cross cutting. Excellent. Thank you. And last but not least, Rachel, please. Thanks, Anna, and thank you also for the invitation. So my name is Rachel coburn Morden. I'm Global Director for Human Rights at Unilever. So along with my team, our role is to really help support Unilever from a policy, process, advocacy and implementation perspective to really drive our human rights strategy. So that's to reflect internally to the business, what the external expectations are, and also to reflect externally the work that Unilever is doing as we continue to implement the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then kind of building on what, what you've just shared, Rachel, and also Julie, would you mind kind of giving us a bit more of an in-depth explanation about what your companies are doing um, right now to support the global move towards paying living wages, um, both at Unilever and also at L'Oreal, please? Uh, Rachel, first. Sure. So um, thanks, Anna. So um, in January of this year, we made a commitment building on our um, commitment that all our direct employees be paid a living wage, which we actually reached at the end of 2020. In January of this year, we expanded that commitment to include all our direct suppliers. So we have approximately 56,000 direct suppliers. That's our tier one suppliers. And by 2030, we want that everyone who directly provides goods or services to Unilever to earn a living wage or indeed a living income. So that's our commitment and we're now in the process of uh, creating both country and portfolio implementation plans. So looking at this through our own uh, value chain, but also understanding that really what we want to do is create a living wage movement and therefore working with peer companies, with expert organisations, with industry platforms to really also drive overall uptake of living wage as a key foundation of, of decent working conditions. Excellent, thank you. And, and how, how exciting to hear that you're at the forefront of this movement towards living wage payments. Um, Julie, um, how about at L'Oréal? Sure. So at L'Oréal, we took the commitment to make sure that all our employees are granted a living wage through our employee human rights policy. And it was issued in January 2020. And we didn't wait uh, to have completed this journey internally because of the poverty, because of COVID, because of, you know, one in five workers earning less than three dollars per, de per day. We also issued just a few weeks after our employee human rights policy. So in April 2020, our L'Oréal for the Future program, in which we took the commitment to make sure that all our strategic suppliers uh, will be granting to their own workers a living wage by 2030 and our strategic suppliers are roughly 80% uh, of our spend. Thank you. So um, thank you. 2030 is going to be a big year then um, to achieve these um, these impressive goals from both, both companies. Um, so now turning to um, Laura and Martin, um, I'd like to ask you what your strategies are to achieve better working conditions, including living wages, both through investment activities and steward stewardship work please. I'll turn to Martin first. Thank you Anna. Um, so in Share Action we have two programs that are focused on um, decent work and, and in encouraging companies um, through investor engagement to um, improve their practices on decent work. So the first is the Workforce Disclosure Initiative which is an investor-backed annual survey of the world's largest companies, uh, listed companies, asking them to disclose better and more data on their workforce policies and practices and it's designed to be a gold standard for data disclosure aggregating all the global expectations and reporting frameworks on workplace topics into one reporting mechanism which is then available to investors um, and it covers not just employees but third-party contractors and supply chain workers and is fully aligned with the un guiding principles on business and human rights and then the second program is our 
good work program. And whilst the WDI is focused primarily on data and data disclosure, the good work program is focused on real world outcomes. Um, and we've been engaging FTSE 350 companies to pay the living wage, tackle insecure work and, and create more diverse and inclusive workplaces since 2013. And we coordinate a, a group of 38 investors with 3.4 trillion assets under management who are working um, to support those goals. We also coordinate with individual activists um, and people with interests in, in these topics. Um, and and buy and help them to buy shares so they can turn up to the AGMs of companies and ask questions about these topics um, at the um, at the AGMs of companies. And then we'll follow up with those engagement letters with the, the investor coalition. Um, we will also explore filing shareholder resolutions, which are a particularly powerful um, approach to um, engagement and stewardship. And we're currently exploring the possibility of filing a shareholder resolution on the living wage at a UK supermarket in 2022. Um, since 2013, we've been engaging on the living wage um, with FTSE 100 companies. And this week we're celebrating the 50th um, FTSE 100 company accrediting as a living wage employer. So that is 50% of the FTSE 100, which is fantastic. And we know that about 89 million has been put in the, into the pockets of low wage workers as a result of this engagement work. That's, um, that's wonderful news. Congratulations. Um, halfway there. So <laughs> great, great news. Um, and and also like from from our work and our interviews with um, with CSL colleagues, we've really found that this issue of there not being good enough data um, has really been a barrier and a, or an issue for companies seeking to go living wage. So it's great to hear about your work and see your work um, on data disclosure. Laura, can I turn to you um, and ask you the same question about um, stewardship work and investment activities and how you can use these to promote the living wage? Sure, so let me start on the investment front. So for us, it's really important to integrate the sustainability topics across the stock selection process and also the way that we construct portfolios. And for that, uh, for our fundamental investment strategies, we also look at the companies beyond their financial returns and the financial metrics. We also look at how sustainability topics can really make a difference in the way that companies are valued in the market. So, for example, if we look at the labor intensive sector, like the food retailer, there we will also look at some sustainability metrics like, you know, labor practices and the type of wages and benefits that they provide to workers as a proxy to understand to what extent companies can be exposed to legal reputational risks, but also how well can these companies also attract and retain talent to make sure that they have a stable workforce. So across our investment strategies, we look into sustainability topics and decent work and, and wage top related matters are also important components of that decision making process. But once we decide to invest in a company and we hold that company in our portfolios, then we also take accountability as shareholders on how to further improve that sustainability performance of our investee companies. And that's why for us, our stewardship work is very important to nudge companies to move that extra mile. And if we talk about the engagement work that we do, there we have more than a decade experience really engaging with companies in different industries on uh, various social topics, including labor practices and human rights and the topic of living wages. So just to give you an example, we've been very active engaging on the topic of you know, accelerating the payment of living wages in the apparel sector for the last three years. And we did that in a collaborative uh, investor platform called the Platform for Living Wage Financials. And that's a coalition of 18 financial institutions really joining forces to together um, leverage the influence that we have as shareholders and really engage with our investee companies to um, give them more resources and more feedback on how they can improve the overall payment of living wages across your global supply chains. So beyond the engagement work, for us, the proxy voting is also very important. So we also integrate sustainability factors in our voting guidelines. And in next year, we're going to start integrating some social factors, looking at to what extent companies uh, carry out uh, proper human rights due diligence 
across our operations and supply chains. And whenever progress is not deemed sufficient, then we might consider voting against specific agenda items. And also filing shareholder resolutions is a useful tool to escalate that engagement and further um, stress and emphasize the importance of specific topics like decent work and labor practices whenever we engage with our investee companies. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's such a thorough answer, touching on so many different dimensions of how you're in, engaging and promoting this work. I just want to um, turn now to think more about what the what the what what the implications of not paying the living wage might be. And just to be really clear, because I know like some people are very familiar with this term living wage, and other people aren't so familiar with it. The idea of the living wage is. Um, usually different from the minimum wage. It's normally much higher than the minimum wage. Um, and it's based, it's based on the idea of having an, being able to afford what it, what it costs to live in the place that you live in. So minimum living wages will vary across space. Um, and it also, as well as earning enough to live on, it also has a, enough to make, make small savings. Um, so you've got some contingency as well. So I just wanted to kind of throw that in because um, not everyone's really familiar ex with exactly what living wages are. Um, and of course, the panel are, um, but maybe not, not everyone um, listening. So now I just want to talk to um, Julie and Rachel again about what the consequences of not paying living wage might be or the, the costs of inaction. Um, and that might be the costs to individual businesses or it might be to society um, as a whole. So maybe we can start with Julie this time and then turn to Rachel after. Okay, so as you said rightly, Anna, very often the living wage is going beyond minimum wage in many, many countries uh, because it takes on board what you said, but also it takes on board the, the dependence, so the size of the, of the family, um, so which vary, of course, a lot from one country to another based on fertility rates, for example. So it, it's also very important. So to, to go back to your question, it's critical to have this in place uh, as a as a, as a big company, but also for states or, you know, you have in the UK great data about that and uh, they are also in the US and other contexts, but it's, it's critical to fight poverty. As I said earlier, one in five workers are earning less than $3 per day to survive and th these are the poor workers. And unfortunately, these numbers are growing when we are looking at the, the last uh, International Labour Organization reports. So fight poverty, you know, is, is, is a key um, point for everyone to act uh, collectively. As Rachel said, we are working together, L'Oréal, uh, Unilever and other companies to embark all our ecosystems on that through different platforms. Um, but another very important points, which is also critical, is that very often uh, concerning, you know, these uh, low skill workers, very often women are impacted, you know, for L'Oréal, it could be our beauty advisors or the cleaning services or the catering or you name it, very often women are at stake and are um, hurt by, by this, by this poverty. So having living wage in place is a very powerful tool to address discrimination, gender pay gap, as I said, poverty and, and many other issues. So again, it's critical to, to fight these uh, problems, systemic problems uh, together. Thank you, Julie. Um, Rachel? Thanks, Anna. I mean, absolutely. I mean, the um, what's the risk of not paying living wage? Well, there's obviously risk to, to the individual, most important, the worker. We know that a living wage as a, a floor, not a ceiling, I think that's really important. We're saying living wage as, as the minimum is absolutely critical for an individual to be able to care for her or his family and also to be able to play that meaningful role within society. And we also know that being able to earn a living wage is an enabler of access to other rights, education, health, linked to good diet, housing, etc. So I think it's completely um, undeniable the importance of the individual. Uh, in, in, in terms of society, of course, the widening inequality that we're seeing has a really destabilizing effect on society, um, which also is something that, you know, we really have to fight against, bearing in mind the huge environmental and social challenges that, that we see 
all the world is is coming against at the moment. Um, from a business perspective, I really question whether poverty wages, which is what we're talking about, fighting poverty in work poverty, is a stable foundation for the resilient and future fit businesses that we all want to see. So I think it's really about really making certain that there is that understanding and there is very clear information how in terms of actually at the individual company level, whether it's attraction retention, whether it's better industrial relations, whether it's improved productivity, less quality incidents, better health and safety, there are many, many benefits at the individual business level. Um, and of course, the reality is if you're putting more money in the pockets of workers, that money gets spent. And that money will often be spent on the products that the business is making or the services the business is providing. And of course, that virtuous circle of more money going into the economy in general, because we also know, and we do want more evidence on this, but we do know that those on lower incomes are much more likely to put that money straight back into the economy. And so I think mm -hmm. that's something that is, is, is not talked about enough and something that we really need to to really get more information on it and, and certainly and certainly talk more about those elements. Um, so lots of really good cases of why actually paying better wages, taking workers out of, of, of poverty is clearly good for the individual, clearly good for business, it's clearly good for society, and also I'd argue also good for governments too. So that you're not topping up wages through the tax system as well and keeping people in often intergenerational policy um, a poverty rather, which is really not being able to either fulfil the potential of individuals or indeed of, of countries and economies. Thank you both. Really, um, really powerful points there. Um, and um, this this um, point about paying more to your workers can actually um, increase their capacity to um, buy what they need to live. It reminds me of the um, the Fordist model of. Um, uh, Ford paying his workers enough that they could um, then become consumers themselves um, of of the cars that they were making in the factory. So there's there's definitely kind of a historical analogy there as well. So um, like we've heard the, biz the business case, the business voice on this. Now I'd like to turn to Laura and Martin again, um, because you know it's one thing if the businesses want to do this. What about investors? Um, how much demand would you say there is amongst investors right now for companies? to provide information on their policies and practices around decent work and living wages, um, maybe as part of a kind of wider um, ESG disclosure that they might be um, interested in. I'll turn to Martin first on that one, please. Thank you. I mean, I think a lot of the, the points that have already been raised about, you know, the value of paying a living wage to, to individuals and, to, and for business is equally true for investors as well. And um, so I think, you know, investors are very much interested in, in understanding how businesses are, are responding to the living wage and how they are um, aiming to pay that living wage. But as you say, they need data to understand that. Um, and, and, and there is a growing demand for data in this space and understanding the workforce policy and practices of, of businesses. And that was largely why we created the Workforce Disclosure Initiative, which I mentioned before. Um, that has the backing of 58 investors with 8 trillion assets under management. Um, and they, they, they created it because they realized that the quality and quantity of data that is available for investors is very poor. Um, and that's partly because, you know, global companies are operating in uh, over multiple jurisdictions and there are different reporting requirements in those different jurisdictions. But it's also the fact that, you know, there's, there's not enough um, quality data being disclosed and, 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 and investors need to understand more about these topics. We actually did um, a, a comparison last year looking at um, companies that had disclosed to the WDI versus companies that um, hadn't, um, looking at public disclosures by companies that hadn't. Um, and we determined that actually um, companies that are disclosing to the WDI actually provide about three times as much data um, to investors um, in, in terms of quantity. I mean, you can 
the quality is harder to measure, but in terms of quantity, there's there's three times the amount, amount of data that's being provided to investors through the WDI platform. Thank you, Martin. Um, Laura. Um, sure. So maybe to add to the discussion, um, from an investment perspective, what we're seeing is this clear trend towards uh, a rise on sustainable investing. So, uh, you know, almost 36% of total assets managed globally are actually channeled to solutions that really look into the sustainability profile of those companies that are uh, being part of the, the different portfolios. And then going back to Martin's point, the, the importance of really having robust data around labor related topics like decent work, living wages, is really crucial for investors to be able to make better informed investment decisions. So if we look at it from a financial maturity perspective, uh, we need clear information on how companies perform on topics like human capital management strategy, uh, data around you know, turnover rates, uh, overall wage levels, social dialogue. So we can really compare them against their peers and, uh, and really pick those companies that really perform better and therefore uh, sort of have a better green credential in our uh, investment strategies. But beyond the financial materiality argument, there is also an increasing demand from our clients and from the investor community to have products that are really looking into the impact that those companies really generate on the societies that they operate and through the products and services that they sell in the market. And then going back to some of the points that uh, Rachel and Julie have mentioned, it is very important that through the, the capital that we provide to companies, we're also supporting business models that are really looking for, you know, paying a living wage and making sure that uh, those societies where these businesses are operating, they can also flourish in a more broader sense, given that they have access to the basic needs and they can really have a more appropriate livelihood. So beyond the overall business case for investors as well, what we see is an increasing demand from clients, from regulators, for the financial industry to be more transparent on the way that we integrate all these sustainability considerations in our investment strategies. So just to give you an example, at the European Union level, we have the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, really giving us clear guidelines for asset managers and asset owners on how we should be, um, you know, putting together um, financial products that are more sustainable and what type of disclosure we need to provide to our clients in a more systematic way. So an important component of this regulation is going to be the implementation of the adverse impact indicators. So these are 18 metrics that all financial institutions will need to report on at the fund level. And it really looks into to what extent the companies that are part of these portfolios are having a negative impact on the environment and on the society. And these 18 indicators will be mandatory for all uh, financial institutions and they will be standardized. So that means that there is an increased need to really bring more information from the corporate side to the market. So then investors can really aggregate that data at the fund level and really share it in a transparent way to their clients on the overall level of, you know, uh, sustainability profile of their products and also to what extent these companies that are part of investment products might have a negative impact on topics like, uh, uh, you know, labor practices and fundamental ILO conventions. Excellent. Um, Laura, thank you. And maybe I can just um, have a quick follow-up question with you, if that's okay, which is about what's the overall willingness, would you say, of companies to engage um, with investors? Um, how, how responsive are companies when investors start kind of promoting the topic of decent work and, and within that, of course, living wages? Yeah, so I think there has been an increasing trend from companies to actually be more uh, receptive from feedback from investors and really more open to discuss this type of uh, topics with us. And I would like to maybe classify the type of findings that we get from these discussions in two different buckets. On one hand, we have the positive trends that we've heard from companies. 
And there we see that in general, most of the companies that we talk to, they agree on the fundamentals. So why decent work is important, why living wage is something that they should really look after and try to implement across our operations. And we also see uh, increased level of transparency on how companies deal with this topic, either through specific internal policies on uh, human rights or, or also the type of expectations that they have on suppliers by uh, requiring them to uphold uh, and pay living wages. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in terms of uh, what are still challenges that we see across our dialogues with companies, I think most of the companies still approach the topic of decent work and living wages as, as a risk mitigation factor, meaning that they really try to uh, comply with the minimum requires, requirements that are legally mandated to make sure that they don't have any reputational or legal, legal risks going forward. And they're going back to your point, Anna, on uh, minimum wages and the fact that they're pretty much lower than living wages. That's something that we hear often from companies that when we talk about wages, they uh, say that they pay a, an attractive salary, and but that usually translates into a, a minimum wage rate. And we know that that's much lower than living wages. Um, and also we see, frankly, quite some regional differences on how companies react and respond to these topics. So, for example, if we talk to companies based in the US, there we see that terms like living wages can be quite partisan and can also uh, be a bit difficult to grasp and to respond for companies. So there, the framing uh, that we investors take in our dialogues is very important to make sure that we are talking about the same concept, even though we might label it in a different way. And finally, uh, in terms of challenges, I think it's also a uh, very you know, uh, important area for improvement, the way that companies translate all the policies and all the commitments that they have around upholding robust labor practices and, and paying uh, decent salaries, how that is being actually implemented in practice. And that disconnect or, or, or gap in terms of disclosures is something that we see often and we think that's uh, something that companies should really work on to really bridge that gap in terms of availability of data in the market that Martin was also referring to before. Laura, thank you. That's such such a thorough um, answer. And I'm, I'm curious, actually, that what is the way that, you, if you don't mind, um, that you frame, that you do frame it, living wages when you're talking to, to businesses? Um, in a lot of the interviews we've done, people have said, well, of course, the living wage isn't the ceiling, it's actually the floor of what we should be thinking about. But I'm, I'm curious, um, if you don't mind, how, how do you frame it yourselves? Yeah, absolutely. So we basically follow uh, internationally recognized uh, definitions of living wages. And we look also at the anchor methodology as a way to really uh, support that uh, living wage definition that really contains all the, the components that we deem appropriate, like having, having that family component, looking into discretionary income and being able to really meet the basic needs. So that's a way that we refer to living wages when we engage with companies. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. OK, um, turning to you, Martin. Um, I'm curious, we've, we've talked already about um, what some of the, the risks of inaction are for society and for the business of not paying living wages. So I wanted to kind of turn a similar question to you um, to ask how might not investing in decent labour conditions result in financial risk? Yes, um, I think I think you know, um, as I said before, you know, the, the, a lot of the same motivations are there for investors as they they are for for businesses. Um, but in in the case of uh, not uh, supporting decent work, I mean, I think one of the the, the, the recent examples that um, most people will know about is is the case of Boohoo, um, where um, it, it's been um, documented widely that the, the wages in, in the garment sector are very low and particularly um, in Leicester in the UK where um, there was a scandal last year where um, it, it then it, it became clear that um, during during lockdown that um, workers in the garment sector were still working and some were working despite having COVID and there was fellow fraud going on and very low wages. 
that actually manifested in a, a ESG scandal for Boohoo, um, and their share price actually fell 175 points, or 43% of their value at that point in time. Um, and there were actually quite a lot of investors who were invested in Boohoo because they were actually rated by some of the rating agencies as, as a as a responsible company, um, and and we can go into some of the the reasons why that why why they were rated as a responsible company, but 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 it did mean that a lot of investors and 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 you know some in particular had to divest from Boohoo at that time. Um, so that that's the sort of reputational risk angle, but I think there's also legal risk. Um, issues around low pay and, and the absence of decent work. Um, and the gig economy is a, a good example of that. Um, you know, uh, the UK Supreme Court ruled um, in February that Uber drivers uh, had been misclassified as independent contractors and they should have been classified as LIMB workers, which gave them a set of different set of rights. Um, but then we saw very soon after that, in April of this year, um, Deliveroo, um, the cycle courier firm, um, have its IPO. And um, we actually saw something unprecedented at that time, that 12 uh, big investment firms actually came out and said that they wouldn't invest in, in, in Deliveroo um, prior to the IPO. Um, and and I think that's unprecedented, that sort of public statement uh, that concerns around decent work had meant that they couldn't invest in in, de in Deliveroo. So I think that, that, that those sorts of risks are very much part of the sort of question that investors look at. Um, but, you know, as, as others have mentioned, that there is a very strong investment case for investing in, in decent work. Um, and people have said that, you know, businesses that invest in decent work provide better jobs. Uh, those jobs are more productive. People are treated well. They're more likely to stay on in their work. You're going to have more engaged um, people working there. That's going to increase customer satisfaction, those sorts of things. And also, um, inequality is a is a risk for businesses for investors, particularly those universal owners who um, have investments across um, multiple businesses. Um, they can't then uh, change the way that they are constructing their portfolios if they're invested across multiple sectors. And so um, things like inequality become systemic risks that they need to address. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, so we've had some very strong cases so far from, from all of you, in fact, about um, like the, the benefits of um, doing this, of committing to living wages and promoting it, um, not just for your own organisations, um, but also beyond and the, the collaborations that, that you've um, got with, with the wider kind of network of people working to promote living wages. Um, I guess um, my next question is more about what the challenges are um, for businesses and for investors. Um, what are the obstacles that, um, that people are facing when they're trying to kind of follow through on these commitments? Um, we've, we've heard a lot about kind of what's being done already, um, amazing work to address issues of data availability and quality of data. So like, maybe kind of stepping aside that kind of issue of, of data, um, what are the other um, challenges that investors and businesses are facing? I'd like to address this one first to Julie and then to Martin, please. Thank you, Anna, for your question. It's true that there are some challenges. Uh, we mentioned already, you know, that it's quite a complex uh, concept and we need to demystify it, you know, when we try to embark our own uh, ecosystems and, and, and stakeholders on that. So explain, demystify and make it uh, accessible, you know. Um, so this is a challenge. Of course, as you mentioned already, the, the measurement and, and the data, uh, the cost, we mentioned that already, and maybe also uh, more particularly, you know, for the SMEs, uh, for them it could be a challenge, a small and medium enterprise, uh, so they need more capacity building than the big, you know, companies to, 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 to start this, this journey. And also, again, it's a journey because we want to avoid 
um, potential negative consequences. For example, because we are talking of low-skill low workers, the robotization or you know the compliance approach versus uh, other kinds of uh, of approach. So we don't want suppliers to uh, stop hiring you know people because they want to be compliant with with living wage. So that's why it's a journey. That's why it takes time, and that's why we are. Uh, providing you know tools and supports uh, especially to to small and medium ones uh, because again it's a challenge for for some of them thanks julie um uh, now to martin please thank you i mean i i did mention earlier that uh, we're seeing uh, 50 uh FTSE 100 companies accrediting as living wage employers but i think it's quite easy in the context of the UK where there's the Living Wage Foundation, there's a strong accreditation scheme and um, the vast majority of the workers that are, are being uplifted in that context are direct employees. Um, I think it's much more challenging in international supply chains um, for some of the reasons that Julie mentioned um, already. But I think, uh, you know, if you look at the apparel sector, for instance, you've got uh, a real challenge of uh, getting uh, suppliers to, to be on board with the ideas um, and, uh, and wanting to share the, the right data. I, I know we didn't want to talk about data, but, but in terms of uh, getting suppliers to pay the living wage, then um, a lot of lead businesses say they don't have visibility of what wages are down the supply chain. Um, there's a reluctance from suppliers to uh, give open costings, to uh, to disclose kind of how they break down their, their costs and whether they ring fence labor costs. And that's partly, I think, because of the structure of supply chains. The fact that um, in a lot of sectors, you have transactional relationships between buyers and suppliers. You have a, a really different sort of set of power relations where you've got you know, a, a small group of buyers and a large number of suppliers. So they, they feel that if they start disclosing this sort of information to to uh, their customer, that that they may then lose business uh, and um, face uh, sort of unfair purchasing practices from their from their clients. Um, so I think all of these sorts of uh, structures of supply chains uh, does uh, create problems for for paying the living wage. Um, and, you know, I, I hear a lot about um, brands talking about leverage over suppliers, but I think that that's a, a, a dual edged sword because, you know, le leverage is power and influence, but that, that power doesn't necessarily can translate in, you know, true partnerships with their supply chain. I think one of the really interesting solutions for this is like to have anonymous uh, supplier voice mechanisms, um, which can actually then feed back information into the um, supply chain about how suppliers are experiencing purchasing practices. Uh, the better buying is a, uh, an example of this that uh, has been developed in the apparel sector, and I would love to see stuff like that developing in other other sectors. Martin, thank you. And um, I think this point about unequal power is so um, so pertinent here. Um, and you know, we've talked already about the the opposite of living wages being poverty wages. Um, and you, know, in, in many ways, that epitomises that um, unequal power relationship um, in in one of the most extreme ways. Um, so maybe on to a more positive note, we've spoken about some challenges. Um, but the next question is about um, what could help either a accelerate progress or be scale up progress um, by businesses and investors um, so that you know we, we heard already about these um, 2030 goals from both L'Oreal and also Unilever but we're curious about what what could help um, push this agenda forwards um, quickly. Um, maybe I could turn to you Rachel um, to take that one first. Sure thanks Anna well I mean I think the really good thing is that um, that it's so much discussion around living wage now and we're seeing some really good strong developments from industry platforms so we had you know back at the start of the year in March we had IDH the sustainable trade initiative launch a call to action that was then followed up in June by the UN global compact we then have business for inclusive growth which Julie and I have 
have worked with a lot on with their statement of support and, and then um, just recently, just um, this week actually, we've had AIM Progress also, the um, membership organisation of fast moving consumer goods to also come out the statement of support. So I think what really can speed up is really that mass of companies actually saying, yep, this is an issue that we need to resolve. We don't necessarily have all the answers, we don't know how to do it, but actually this is what we're going to work on and we're going to share. We're going to share best practice, obviously, within the limitations, correct limitations of competition all but where we can. We're going to share some of the challenges, what's tricky. We're going to share the tools um, and we're really going to create those movements at a country level with all the key stakeholders coming together and not forgetting, of course, the critical role that trade unions um, have in this. So for me, that's what's really going to help. And we just want companies just to say, don't know all the answers, but yes, this is something that we're going to start looking at. And there is a lot of tools and guidance out there. I've talked about the platforms, but also whether it's the work done by UN Global Compact, by Urban, by IDH, by the Fair Wage Network, by others, there is more and more guidance in terms of how companies can start looking at this, both in their own operation, operations and their supply chain. So I would simply say, you know, the time for, for working on living wages now, for everyone that's come together and let's just start addressing it. Well, Rachel, thank you. Um, very inspiring words. Um, and um, Lucy, I know you're um, communicating with people after on the on LinkedIn, so maybe it would be possible to put some of those links up that Rachel just mentioned, so that people can follow up if they're if they're interested. Because um, I think there are really lots of very good advice there from Rachel um, and from everyone else. Now I'm going to um, close my part of the session um, and thank you so much um, to all the speakers for, for your fascinating answers. I'm going to hand back over to Lucy now, who's going to um, run a Q and A. So hopefully there'll be some audience questions that we can enjoy now. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Anna. Um, so we've had some, some questions in from the audience. The first, Martin, is to you um, in relation to the points that you made around the gig economy, which is should workers without um, a permanent contract and or guaranteed minimum hours ever be classed as receiving the living wage? Good to hear your insights on that. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, no, I, I think not. I think I think. Um, Wage is only one co component of, of quality work, and and I think you know uh, to say that somebody has uh, a living wage requires them to also have um, other aspects of uh, um, quality work that includes um, you know visibility of the hours worked, um, a a contract that reflects the hours that they work, um, and an, a decent notice period um, so that they know. Um, and can plan for the work that they do. Um, so I, I think those those sorts of things are are critical to to um, a decent work, um, a living wage, and a decent work. And and um, the Living Wage Foundation have developed the Living Hours Standard to reflect those um, those concerns as well. And and I think you know the gig economy is just um, obviously one really. Uh, obvious example of, of where these issues of um, uh, contract type, uh, visibility of hours, flexible, um, unfair flexibility for workers um, is uh, is very high on sort of pub the public radar. But I think that these sorts of issues are across a number of different sectors in, in the UK. I, I went to an event um, this week um, by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation looking at that in the care sector. We know that we know that these issues are across multiple sectors in the UK and indeed globally. Fantastic, thank you. Um, one more question that, that actually came in before the panel um, is in relation to what some of the solutions are for those working in developing economies and particularly in Asia who are um, perhaps poorly located and recovering from the pandemic. Um, Rachel, I know you mentioned um, about the destabilizing effect um, that not being paid a living wage might have. I wonder if we could hear your insights in terms of how payment of a living wage could enhance resilience across supply chains, particularly for those in developing economies um, in Asia. Well, I think also when, when companies are looking at, you know, the future of business and supply chains, we know that supply chains are changing. We know that factories are becoming more, more automated. We know there's more tech technology coming in. And we want to really be able to also upskill workers 
and therefore linked to that upskilling is also that ability to be able to learn to earn more wages. And if you look at someone like India, you see huge changes actually in the way that supply chains are being run. But you've also obviously got large numbers of people who are still working in labour intensive industries. So I think resilience for me is about making certain that supply chains are future fit, but everything has to be done with that rights based foundation. The respect for human rights has to be the foundation of all the changes that are coming. So when we're looking at, for example, future of work, everything has to be with that foundation of respect for, for human rights. I think also the reality is, you know, resilience, it just simply, you cannot have a resilient supply chain if you have factories or, or any kind of business where work, the working conditions are just simply not um, associated with the kind of products that you want to see coming out of the factory. If workers are tired and they're worried because they are earning very little money and working all hours, they're not going to be able to be able to produce the goods or the surfaces that actually the buyer is wanting to buy and of course the consumer ultimately is going to want to have. So I think, you know, for me that's absolutely fundamental. You cannot run successful supply chains long term on the backs of workers on poverty wages. And for me that if there was any indication of what supply chain resilience is, it's certainly not that. Thank you. And we've actually had another question in relation to that point about the, the human um, impact being a driver. Um, Julie, if I could direct this question to you, which is, um, is the business case enough or you know, do you use um, the moral or perhaps human um, case when you're kind of appealing um, to investors and other businesses? Sure, good good question, Lucy. It's true that sometimes some people tend to forget that we are talking about low skilled workers, you know, and, and, and it's sometimes it's very important to remind, as Rachel said, as Laura said, Martin, as everyone said, that we are talking about human beings. You know, so the, the, the moral case is, is sometimes also useful because when you give very concrete examples of, for example, when you are granted a living wage, you can have access to menstruation product or to basic health care or, you know, so we sometimes we provide such practical example to illustrate that living wage is not at all a luxury. Uh, yeah, definitely. Great, and more questions coming in. So this next one is how can the living wage um, be insured in rural areas of countries like, for example, Brazil, um, where governments don't necessarily have intentions um, to uh, fortify um, uh, command and control of labour laws, for example. So um, I will direct that question to um, Laura in relation to perhaps supply chains and investment activities in, in Brazil, where you're you're seeing that, you know, do you have experience engaging with um, stakeholders in those kind of rural areas and what difference do you think that makes? Yeah, so that's indeed what we were talking about before in terms of uh, what's the level of responsibility from companies and to what extent they are willing to go beyond what's legally mandated, right? So I think there, you know, uh, companies have the, the ability to impose a specific requirements to their suppliers. So in order to be able to have a commercial relationship with the specific suppliers, uh, regardless of where is it in Brazil or any other country where with a broad uh, rural area, then there needs to be like a specific provision on what type of, you know, labor standards um, the company is expecting from their suppliers and to what extent that the level of wages that are being provided do uh, enable these uh, workers at the beginning of the supply chain to actually uh, meet their, their basic needs and really earn what we've been talking about, a living wage, right? So I think there, the type of leverage that companies have is really through the type of um, clauses that they establish in their com commercial agreement with companies and the type of provisions that they also include in their supplier's chain, chain, um, supplier code of conduct. And of, then, of course, one thing is to just uh, require that from suppliers and the other thing that we would also like companies to do is to really audit those suppliers to see to what extent they are really enabling and committing and upholding the type of requirements that are included in the code of conduct. So that's the type of you know tools that companies could have at hand to make sure that living wages are being paid in rural areas. And in Brazil I can add that you know there is a 
UN Global Compact Local Network, working on living wage and living income actively. So it's also something to consider because they have been issuing uh, not only at the at the New York level, but also in the Brazil uh, context, some guidance for local uh, Brazilian companies, both on living wage and on living income. So. And maybe if I can add something uh, on top of what Julie mentioned, and another important component is also how companies uh, lobby or discuss these topics with governments, right? And to what extent they're really engaging in meaningful discussions with local governments to make sure that uh, wage levels, minimum wages are being uh, uh, right, are being increased over time to match what it's uh, uh, specified as a living wage in specific regions and using that power as a you know corporation being operating or having a supply chain in specific countries to really engage in a meaningful dialogue with local governments and change uh, you know specific uh, local policies to make sure that the standards being applicable are more in line with living wage estimates is also a very important tool that companies can use. Fantastic, thank you. Um, one last audience question, which is around um, what are the future trends that you anticipate um, and hope for in, rel in relation to decent work and the living wage? And Martin, I'll, I'll direct that question to you. Well, I, I think, uh, I, I mean, I, I want to congratulate Unilever on that, that and, and, and Danone on, um, on the, the commitment, L'Oreal, sorry, on the commitment to uh, um, the 2030 goal. I, I think I would like to see a lot more companies make that same sort of commitment over that sort of time frame. I think if we if we can see lots of companies making that commitment, maybe we'll we'll see a lot more momentum and and uh, and make it more more of a living reality for people in the next 10 years. Thank you. Okay, so we're we're almost out of time, and with our last minutes, I'd like to ask each of you just to spend one minute each um, on this question, which is, if you had to advise a group of like-minded investors and companies who are wanting to um, start with the promotion and adoption of the living wage in their supply chains, what would you tell them, and, and you know, on where they should start? So, um, Rachel, let's start with you. I would simply say just stop talking about it and, and start now. If it, if it was talking to a business and if I was talking to an investor, I would say much the same. Start engaging with companies, start asking the questions. I think now is the time for action. Very heartening to hear that echoing on the social side as well, because obviously those are the clear messages coming out of COP26, less blah, 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 and more action. So it's great to see that across the sustainability issues. Thank you. Um, Julie, let's let's hear from you. What you would in tell what, like minded companies. Yeah, in one minute, I, I would say that it's a uh, it's achievable. There are uh, already great uh, resources available and data and organization. So let's not reinvent the wheel and let's work together to to do it collectively. Fantastic, Laura. Maybe more uh, directed to the investment community, so really look for that collaboration to leverage the influence that you have as a shareholder and be able to come together with like-minded investors to engage with the investee companies that you have in your portfolios to start those discussions on how they can accelerate the payment of living wages. Excellent. And Martin? And I, I think the, the 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 message I would say is just don't reinvent the wheel. There are so many organisations and initiatives um, and really great work already happening um, on the living wage. Um, you know, yesterday we we held an event with the Living Wage Foundation, the UN Global Compact Living Wage for US and the World Benchmarking Alliance, and that was the key message coming out of that event yesterday: is connect the dots. There are so many initiatives out there and, and there's a growing movement. So don't reinvent the wheel, join in and, and, and support that great work. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to all of you for your really interesting and thought provoking insights um, and Anna for moderating the discussion. And um, I'd also like to offer special thanks to our colleagues at CISL, Jason, Tio, Marina Zarilla and Anna Lowe for making the event possible. So. Thank you all and have a very good weekend.